Uh, uh, so basically, um, Tanat Talk had a video recently on the question on if, if Jesus can die for a man's sin. And there was a rabbi on there, I forgot his name, but basically he referenced Exodus 32, 30, um, when Moses is asking to be punished for the sins of the Israelites, I believe for the golden calf. And the focus seemed to be on the guilt sin as it relates to, um, you know, Jesus's death on the cross. And then he also referenced Deuteronomy 24, 16 and Ezekiel 18. And, uh, you know, I, I was satisfied with the answers, but as I was having this conversation with my Christian friend, you know, he disagreed. And his, his biggest argument was the difference between the gift of eternal life, um, which is the atonement of the, I guess, of Jesus dying on the cross, uh, and that which allows for repentance. And I think that's what the argument he was saying. What, are, what is your response to your or your uh, perspective on that? Regarding anything metaphysical, I'd rather stick with what the Torah says. And I'll bring up opinions brought down in the Talmud, what's known as Agadah. There is a statement, a metaphysical notion, uh, that, that the death of a righteous man atones for sin. Now, we have other concepts similar to that. Like when people say Kadish Yatum, the mourner's Kaddish, which at least post the 13th century was taught to also atone for sin, i.e. bring someone out of hell, out of purgatory, and get them one step closer to getting out. Again, this is someone doing something else for you that you're benefiting from. I remember in Israel, they would pay yeshiva students to say Kaddish for people who died without from relatives who, who would typically say Kaddish for them. And other notions like that charity brings atonement. Now that does have a sort of biblical source. Also that exile atones. But anyways, it appears like this like by Chazal. What does that really mean? One, it's optional to believe because the Torah doesn't say this. right? In terms of atonement for an afterlife, the notion of an afterlife is not in the five books of Moses. So anyone who wants to think that um, someone could do something for someone else vicariously, I don't know. You know, Jews believe that as a way of solidifying their identity. In other words, Jews believe, and this is tied to a lot of what we've been saying here today, is that because they're Jewish, they are in some way held to a higher standard, they're closer to God. This is irrespective of any decisions they have made in this world, but a decision that their parents made for them. Now, I don't believe this, but this is what the vast majority of Jews believe. So, what they're saying is that someone long, long ago did something vicariously for them that they are now benefiting from today. I don't know how that's any different from some messianic <laughs> assuming that Yeshua did something for them vicariously a long, long time ago that they're benefiting from today. In other words, we should use the same weights to judge messianic ideas as we use to judge Jewish ideas. Now, I'm just commenting on this. I'm not tied to any one idea here. But in Judaism, we have this notion of schut avot, that because of what our patriarchs did, we benefit. Now, the real question is benefit to what extent? Now, schut avot was good enough to get someone or give someone the opportunity to leave Mitzrayim. Absolutely, the opportunity, because Jews weren't dragged out of Egypt. And the Chazal teach that the vast majority of Jews actually stayed behind in Egypt. But like virtually every metaphysical notion, Schut Avot was blown out of proportion to teach like many of the Kabbalists do, or at least for sure mystics post the Tanya, that this initial Schut was enough to give someone an elevated soul above anything else in creation. And this initial Schut was enough to make one part of God himself. Now, I don't know if it's me, but it, that sounds a lot more philosophically problematic than just believing that someone died and through his death he atoned for your sins. But no one attacks that. Well, no one except a rationalist. I'm just Actually, telling you what you... Yeah? Would you say, even before the world was created, if something by charity was done, for us to even have repentance towards mitzvot? Oh, I don't believe in this. Um, 
I don't believe that. I'm just telling you what people that's believe. Right. Well, that's metaphysical, too. Uh, no, it's because I believe in free will. I don't even believe that God knows the future. And the Rambam held to this understanding. It says in Perkovo, not that Perkovo is source material, but it says that everything is under heaven but the fear of heaven. So here, the Rambam's opinion on it is that God controls everything with the exception of man's free will, especially free will to do teshuvah or come close to God. So I think it would be unbecoming of a just God to have anyone preordained or predestined for anything. I mean, what's the point? Who would want to follow a God who behaved like this? And I guess many people have no problem following a God who behaves like this, but I do. Now, if you cut out the whole notion of heaven and hell, then you don't have a question or argument to begin with. Because well, what are you being saved from? It seems that the Torah deals with the nation, the earthly nation. Nothing about punishment in the afterlife or reward in the afterlife. But for us to ask such a question that if the death of someone could atone for your sins... Why? Because in terms of Yom Kippur, this deals with national atonement. The Paschal Lamb had nothing to do with national atonement for Israel, nor did it have to do with personal atonement. But the question doesn't compute from a Torah perspective. Yeah, and there's actually a distinction between forgiveness and atonement. So Yom Kippur deals with atonement. The Paschal Lamb had to do with neither. The reason I'm mentioning it is that Christians typically get him confused. They confuse the sacrifice that Jesus did with the national sacrifice that the priest offered. It's an idea that I can't process anymore. I mean, heck, I wasn't always Jewish. Right. Over 20, you know, 25 years ago, I was a Christian. But once I've adopted this Torah mindset, I try to look at things through Torah lenses. And it doesn't compute. It just doesn't compute. It might as well be a different religion. This is why in terms of Messianics, as long as we can agree on the keeping of Torah i.e. the proper worship of God, anything outside of that that doesn't directly conflict with the Torah shouldn't be enough for me to exclude you as my brother or my sister. So this is why I encourage people that if they're coming from the Messianic movement and they live in the middle of nowhere and all they have is a Messianic synagogue, but they don't believe that JC is the Messiah, but they want someone to congregate with, heck, congregate with them. And don't take your kids out of the Messianic movement unless you're about to move into an orthodox community because I've seen it too many times that people adopt some noite existence in the mountains of of uh, like Montana and their kids go off. Their kids become atheist. It's no, no. Listen, I, I stay on an island and my three kids, like two are in university, third one's an apprentice. 